Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for allowing us the privilege of gathering together in your name, for worshiping you, Lord God. And we just ask for your presence, Father, in this building, the anointing of your Holy Spirit on all our hearts, all our minds, all of our ears, Father, um, that we would draw closer to you, Father. We just ask you to grow us from the inside out, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4, I'm going to deal with a little more murder and what I'm going to call the roots of our family tree. You know, if you really read the Bible, you'll see that all the intrigue and all the drama and the craziness that's on television has been here for all time. All the same scandals, same reasons, once again, all things are common among men. And there's nothing new under the sun. Well, last week we left off with Cain complaining to God that his punishment was just too much for him to bear. I think we too often feel that when we're caught in a a transgression that we're being punished too harshly. And that's just part of our Adamic nature, our humanity, our sin nature. It's a way to deflect responsibility and it's a sign of being self-centered. It's a sign of, that we are not looking at our sin, that we don't see our sin as God sees it. So instead of repenting, we try to get out of the consequences. That's just how we are. Some may be worse than others. But today we're going to continue with the saga of Cain, and we're going to take back up with his conversation with God. If you will, go back <clears throat> to Genesis 4, verse 14. Cain here says, Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now, we have to understand what Cain is doing here. And it's not just that he's just deflecting. We have to realize that to even suggest that God is unjust is a problem. It's a sin. And it's a slap in the face of God. Cain has done what his mother and father did. That is that they misjudged the character of God. How do we do this? How do we misjudge someone? We do it when we speak of someone whom we truly do not know. I mean we don't really know them. Prejudice. Prefix, P-R-E, means to prejudge. You know before you actually know, or you judge before you know, based on some sort of superficial knowledge or appearance or something like that. Cain's problem at his root is that he did not have a relationship with God. And when we fail in our walk, it's for the same reason, because we're not walking with God daily as we should, and if we, we can't just think of it as days, like today I did good, today I did bad. No, we have to not only think of it as days, that's one way to look at it, and that's a good way to, to keep uh, moving forward. We also have to look at it as areas, because we, when we say, I did good today, and we look back and say, boy, I was good today, I didn't give anybody the number one driver award on 575, or saying, I didn't say any bad words, I didn't beat anybody to death, I didn't shoot anybody, I didn't steal any paper clips from the office, we think, well, I'm doing good. But that's because we are assessing our status for that day in the areas that we're already probably pretty good at in. And I still ended it with a preposition, so it's wrong. Anyway. But we're still doing that. The problem is there are other areas that we don't look in and assess, and those are the real problem areas, and those are the ones that get us. We turn our focus inward. Uh, and to self-assess, that's one thing. I mean, that's the time to turn it, turn it inward. But when we t- turn our lives inward, inwardly, we become the center of our own little universe. And in- instead of taking part in the broader universe, that is the plan of God. Isn't that's what he actually created us to do? Instead of focusing on God, who in turn redirects our focus to others, we slowly begin to retreat inward. And then we become self-absorbed, and we're watching it happen right here in front of us. However, 
I want you to see that God is not interested in having Cain killed. He has attempted to work with him to convict him of his sin. And now Cain's got to pay the piper. God places some sort of mark on him so that no one will kill him. We don't know what that is. You know, did he give him a hat? Did he tattoo him on the head? Did he make him wear a sign? You know, no. Nah, you know, some reason, some way, everybody knows, don't mess with him, okay? Just leave him alone. All right, go to verse 16. It says, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Arad, Arad begot Mahuziel, and Mahuziel begot Methuziel, and Methuziel begot Lamech. So we see here that Cain headed east to a land known as Nod, and I, off the top of my head, I believe Nod in Hebrew means land of wandering, but that's not really important. But Enoch has a son. He built a city named for his son. This is not the same Enoch that's famous that we'll talk about later. This is an, it's just a common name like John or whatever, you know, just Enoch, just one of those common names. So he's got a name. He names the, son, the city after his son. And extra biblical material shows that, that Enoch did have to wander, but he was allowed to settle in the city in his old age because, you know, there's only so much wandering you can do once you reach 900 years old or whatever it is. Your walker is worn out by then, and they didn't have Medicare, I'm sure, you know, that sort of stuff. But I want you to look at something that is easy to look over. First of all, to have a city, you have to have a viable population. Got to be lots of folks. Well, for many of us, we read it and we think, all right, we got Adam and Eve. You got, uh, well, Cain killed Abel, so that's just three of them. And then uh, you got Seth, so there's four dudes or three dudes and their mother. And then, and then uh, uh, what's his name? Cain walks off. Is that who we're talking about? Yeah, Cain headed east and walks up on a woman. Hey, you're mine. That's not it. How do we get a viable population? Well, and somebody asked me this last week, and this is actually the most asked question about the entire Bible. Bible. Where did Cain get his wife? Well, the answer is really pre- fairly simple. It might creep you out at first, but that's because we're looking at it from here going backwards. Eve's name means mother of all living. So Eve was the mother of all living. It started with two. She's mama. So everybody that was there after that, the first generation came from her. So Cain walks off, and he's got a wife. Probably already had the wife, but at this point they uh, have a son. So where did he get his wife? He was a sister or cousin. Now, if you're from certain states, that might not freak you out. <laughs> you can't do that today because of something called a genetic load. Actually, inbreeding, as we call it, was not outlawed until you get on over in, into the Levitical law. And then it says, don't be marrying your cousin. And once again, some states would do well to reintroduce that thought. But why can't we do that? Why did God make it illegal in the law, but at this point, it's not? Well, first of all, you only got two people, so you got to start somewhere. But what is the reason for actually outlawing it later? It's because if you marry too close of a relative, you wind up, and I'm not going to say that, you wind up with birth defects. You can. You wind up with sometimes one too many chromosomes. And this is what happens. In our DNA... You, have, you get 50% of it from your mother, you get 50% of it from your father. In that DNA, that code, there are mistakes. And you say, well, not, I don't have any mistakes. Yes, you do. And they'll show up the older you get. But you do have mistakes. All of us, if you wear glasses, how many of you can take your glasses off like this, lay them on the table, and the glasses will rock? They won't sit square down on the table. You know why? Because one ear is higher than the other. That's the God's honest truth. If you also have glasses, you know that one eye is stronger than the other. You also have one leg that is a little bit longer than the other. And you can prove this. Just start walking in the desert. And if you walk long enough, you'll go in a circle. 
You will. Y'all never been through the desert on a horse with no name? Another 70s song. Anyway, that, that is the God's honest truth. You have, we have issues in our DNA that come from all sorts of it, ultraviolet light. But there, when sin came into play, stuff started going wrong. And what happens if you marry your first cousin, not once or twice removed, your first cousin, or a sister or something like that nowadays, what happens is you compound the error. And it's kind of like, uh, I don't advocate gambling, but a, a slot machine or one-armed bandit. And when you marry in close like that, you pull the handle, you got more you've got more uh, of a chance of those same defects popping up on each side of the code. And that's why you can't do it. All right? Or then, you, like I said, something will have wrong. You compound the, at least the very possibility of that. Now, at this time on Earth, the genetic load, as they call it, these problems, these, these defects, are not, that, are not bad. This is for within the first few generations. All right. So you think, man... Eve had it. She had it rough, didn't she? Well, she lives to be eight or 900 years old. That's a lot of kids. One a year. Aren't y'all loving that, ladies? Wow, I could have been 800 years old. Yeah, and you could have had 300 kids, 300 labors. Not. You know, yeah, think about it. So you do this over the span of time, and you do the math, and I didn't because I don't. But those that do... It's a, you can have a large population with this, within just a few years. You don't have the, the def defect issue because the genetic load is not bad. You don't have that until after the flood is really when you start seeing it. And after the flood, you'll see that the lifespan drops off from 900 and something down to the average. By the time you get to King David, it's a perfect exponential curve. comes down to about 75, 80, 85 years. And don't let anybody tell you, well, then back in the day, if you lived to be 40, you were an old man. Hogwash. Go to an old cemetery. And I do that. I don't know. I'm just OCD about this. When I see a tombstone, I have to automatically calculate the age of the person and figure it out. Most of the people, unless they're hit by a train or were in a war or, you know, died some, in some accident, most people still live about the same age we do now. So your medicine, our medicine hasn't helped us really live any longer. The reason you come to an age of 40 is because they figure in child deaths. And m most, a lot of children at that, back in the day, before antibiotics and all that, a lot of them would die prior to being five years old. So if you average that in to, to 80... Guess what? You come up with 40. So that's how the statistics make it look bad. They live to be way older than us, and people from ever since the flood have lived to about the same age we are now. All right. Got a viable population. We got a city. We got longer lives, which, he, which means you can have more kids. Go for it, ladies. And then where did Cain get his wife? We've covered that, basically. Now, between verses 18 and 19, if you're paying close attention, we span five generations. You have this guy, Lamech. Took for himself two wives. Obviously had a lot of money. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain, Tubal Cain was Naamah. So Lamech takes two wives. This is the first account we have of bigamy or polygamy. Bigamy is just two. And then the Bible. The Bible does not condone this. I get tired of hearing that. People use this to justify plural marriages. Well, it's in the Bible. So is murder. That doesn't mean it's condoned. It's just mentioned. They're just being honest. Which lends itself to the, to the uh, credulity of the Bible in that when you're trying to make stuff up, you don't tell the bad stuff. You don't tell the dirty secrets. You just tell the good stuff in order to win people over. But they're being honest here. Lamech had two wives. It's not condoned. But what we do see as we go through the Old Testament is that it did become part of culture. And that is so dangerous. Because when we let something slip in, 
and we see it out there, and then we kind of become desensitized to it. Well, that's just what everybody does. That's just what everybody wears. That's what everybody watches. Whatever the case may be. You know, that's what everybody drives. You start letting Priuses in, and before you know it, you know, real vehicles become obsolete. You know, that's what, if you have a Prius, I'm just playing, get a sense of humor. <laughs> I'm going to drive by you and sound my pipes off on my truck as I go burning all that gas. But the point is, when something slips in and it kind of is it's still on the periphery, but it begins to get a toehold in the culture. That's what is happening here. And so by the time we get to King David, kings are known for this. You know, like I said, I made the, the, the tongue-in-cheek remark, he must have had money. Just, but the point is, guys that had a lot of money had a lot of wives. That's a lot more people to feed. Just think of the shoe bill. All right? So you got, you know, that's what I'm talking about here. He, this becomes ingrained in the culture. It's never condoned, but it seeps in. And pretty, after a while, it's normal. And we just accept it. Even though the Bible does not condone it in any shape, form, or fashion. Jesus made it clear that this was not the way it was intended to be. In Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6, Jesus said, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Let not man separate the two, not the three, four, five, whatever, the two. That's the way it's supposed to be. And then if we have this. Jesus is quoting Genesis. He's quoting the marriage of Adam and Eve. And you know what he's quoting it? He's just quoting it as actual history. Not an analogy. Not a type. Not some metaphor. Ancient, actual history. And he does it again and again. So for those that, well, this is kind of means this and it means that. That's subjective. Once you get into that realm, it can mean anything anyone says. Well, I think it means this. And I think it means that. Well, isn't that sweet? And it's just like, I want to say a Spurgeon, but I'm not sure it was. He went to one of these deals where everybody gave their opinion of the Scripture, and somebody asked him what he thought about it. He said, well, we all, learned, we all heard each other's opinions, and none of us learned anything. Because it's just, you know, oh, I thought that's sweet, isn't it? Yeah, that doesn't mean it's right, just because it's sweet. And we do see more and more of this plural marriage as we go deeper in the Bible. But once... What started here with one man was a slippery slope, and it, it would engulf entire cultures so that by the time Israel gets a king, it's commonplace. We also want to see that by the time Lamech has his sons, technology is flourishing. These are not cavemen. We'll deal with that. You know, what you see as a caveman in the bone, that's, we'll deal with that later. But these are not cavemen. This is not Tarzan know where Tarzan go. Tarzan not know where Tarzan go. This is not that. These are intelligent people. They read and they write. And they know the science. Yes, the science of animal husbandry and farming and agriculture and all that sort of thing. And they know the science. This is the guy. He's the Jubal's the father of all those who play the harp and flute. They hadn't made it to guitars yet. But they're playing harps and flute. Why do I say that? And ancient wind instruments have been found. For some reason, that most of them are in the key of A. For whatever reason, I don't know. But um, we see this. Do you understand that science, excuse me, music, used to be taught as a science? It's very specific. It's just like mathematics. You don't just happen up on it. You don't just go, hmm, 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 hmm. How do you know it's in key? And some people don't. I understand that. But for those that do, there's a, there's a system to it. There's a science to it. You don't just happen up on that. You're not just banging on the cave wall one day and go, mm, sound good. No. <laughs> there are laws that, you know, that, that have to be known. You don't just walk into it. Tubal Cain is an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Now, we all know what bronze is, and we know what iron is. We know, all know what iron is. Some of us may or may not know what bronze is. It's brass. It's got 
some hard iron, maybe still, I don't know, something else mixed in with it. That's the point. We know what it is. All right, now go make me some of it. Because you don't just dig it up out of the ground and go, there's an eye beam. Let's go build this. That doesn't happen. You have to know metallurgy. You have to be able to heat some stuff to a certain uh, temperature and mix it with this at another certain temperature. And then this, the dross has to be pulled off of it in order to make steel and iron. Some of it's brittle, some of it isn't. You have to know what you're doing. There has to be a succession of knowledge to gain these technologies. If for some reason we were plunged into a Mad Max scenario where all technology is gone, <clears throat> and here we are driving the last of the big V8s around, Priuses are dead. Nobody's, you know, you can't outrun the marauders in a Prius, you know. <clears throat> but, and all of a sudden somebody goes, I got an idea. Let's build an airplane. Have you seen one? Yeah, we all have. All right, we'll build one. You can't do it. Even my brother that works on them, building them, and I used to build them, you can't build one. You can build the parts you build, but the parts are, were given to us, and the rivets and everything else. You can't just go out there and dig up stuff and make aluminum or aluminium if you're from in England. Which, you know, it's not spelled that way, so I don't know how they get that. But at any rate... You know, you can't, the point I'm making is you have to have technology to support this. Just because you build an airplane now doesn't mean you can make one from scratch. All of this, all of this um, has to be brought up. It's a succession of technology. These people are not cavemen, hunters, gatherers, or whatever. So Jabel's the father of, you know, people that his bunch, is, his family business is generally farming. Jubal, they're all musical people. Tubal Cain's father of, you know, I am a man, a manly man. They make bronze and iron, which, you know, they blacksmithing and silversmithing and all that stuff. So we got agriculture, arts, and industry straight out of the gate. We also find that Lamech is a murderer. Verse 23 says, Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice. Now, I've said that. <laughs> Hear my voice. I don't get no response. I don't know. You know, it's biblical though. I guess I don't know. Wise of Lamech, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And some people, depending on what commentators you you study here, some people think that he's scared. Other people think he's bragging. Well. If Cain's going to, if Abel's death is avenged sevenfold, well, for what I did, seventy-sevenfold. I don't think that's it. I think he's genuinely scared. And if I can appeal to some extra biblical literature quoted, the book of Jasher, what it says is that uh, Lamech is an old man. He's in the, in the uh, field with his son, and they see something far off, the boy does, and thinks it's an animal. So he says, Dad... Now, this is where the story gets spotty, in my opinion. He says, there's a, a bear, I don't know, a T-Rex over there. And so Lamech pulls his arrows and sends about two of them off. Now, how you do this and you can't see, I don't know. But it, but it says, the, the tradition says that the arrows hit this. It was a man, not a bear or a T-Rex, and it was Cain. And they get up there trying to see what they killed. And they look, and uh-oh, it's a dude. It's Cain. He's dead. And then Lamech, he's blind, he can't really see that well, and he's so upset, he, he goes, claps his hands in grief, and in doing that, he hits his son and kills him. Now, whether it happened exactly that way, I don't know or not. Just a little color commentary, take it or leave it. In any case, it's placed here, the murder that Lamech commits, is placed here in the narrative to show us the moral condition of the world at the time. It does not take long for evil to take root and begin to multiply like a plague in the population. Once again, once it gets a toehold, and people worry about on the political scene, you can't legislate morality, you cannot legislate people's hearts, but you can legislate moral laws. And when something that was, is a sin becomes legal, though we don't partake in of it, maybe uh, partake of it as individuals, the nation has sanctioned it. 
And what you see in the Bible is that brings a national judgment. Now, don't think every time there's a hurricane, a storm, the, the grasshoppers come through your garden or anything else, you know, but we just have to be aware that it's, it's evidence of the way the country is going. So we see the moral conditions and how everything's going downhill from there. And then the story turns to Adam and Eve once again. Look at verse 25. It says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. And, quote, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh, or Enos. Y'all know he was a deputy on the Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> Enos. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. So Adam and Eve had another son. They named him Seth. The name means substitute. Now I'll tell you, and I'll tell you, I've told you once, I'll tell you a thousand times. When you are dealing with Hebrew, when you're dealing in the Old Testament, and you see a proper name of a town, a person, <clears throat> whatever, a valley, <clears throat> look up what that word means. Because they didn't just go, hmm, I think I'll call that, whatchamacallit. I just, we're laying it Atlanta. I don't know what Atlanta means. It may or may not have a meaning. But in Hebrew, stuff has a meaning. When they give a name to a place, there's a reason for it. And they give this boy a name here, Abel. It means substitute. Because he, now they've got someone who's substituting in her eyes for, um, uh, uh, excuse me, Seth is substituted in her eye, is a substitute in her eyes for Abel. Which shows us what? We start seeing the idea of substitution or substitutionary atonement. In theology, this is a big deal. Because how can I pay for your crime? How can I fix, in that sense, what someone else has done wrong? When the, in the, the idea of substitutionary atonement is someone else comes and pays your fine. Someone else comes and pays your bill. Who paid our bill? Jesus. Why? Because we couldn't pay it. Why? It's so too expensive. You can never do it. So, therefore, it has to be free. Yet, whoever cashes in the coupon, so to speak, has to be a perfect sacrifice. And that ruled all of us out. So, we see right here, substitutionary atonement. And this... It, let me just put it this way. And we see here, Seth... We're going to read about him. He's mentioned in the genealogy that we're going to see in the next chapter. His name substitutes in there in this long line of names that leads from Adam to eventually Jesus. Then we have in the last portion of this verse, it says, Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. And this, this verse has traditionally been interpreted two different ways. One is in the positive that, all right, now men are starting to, yay, worship God. But we read kind of the opposite, and it is just anecdotal. It is one snippet out of thousands and thousands of people running around, granted. But we have this verse, Some, you know, now begin people to call the name of the Lord once again. Some will interpret it in the positive. Others will interpret it in the negative, saying that men began to call on themselves as in the name of the Lord. And historically, I think that is accurate. But I actually believe both of them could be mingled here because when when stuff starts going haywire to the wrong side, there are people, the remnant. There is a revival many times on the other side. Um, I believe So I believe you can actually combine these two interpretations. The rampant spread of paganism could have spurred a revival among true believers. And what we get to in Genesis 6, you're really going to see what is really driving things over the edge and how weird stuff is really getting. But I want to sh tell you, I want to hope to impress upon you just what all is going on and how crazy it was. We also see that up until this time, up until now, worship was done in a more solitary setting. Cain and Abel went to church that day and they offered their sacrifices, maybe at the same time, maybe not. I don't know. We don't have any rules, really. We talked about that last week. But we know that a sacrificial system was in place from the story of Cain and Abel. We don't have any of the details, but there was a system. And now men are calling on the name of the Lord. It appears that there's a more public form of worship that seems to be coming about. Whether it is true worship or it is paganism, both are spreading. This could be 
I mean, this, is, of course, is probably aided through technology and all that kind of stuff. But here we go. Everything is, you're seeing temples built and, and houses of worship and cults are forming and this sort of thing. This is spreading as the population spreads. <clears throat> and then that segues us right into Genesis chapter 5 where we come to the infamous begats of the Bible. Mm. Oh, Marge, nobody wants that, you know. And many people make the mistake of reading through these quickly or even skipping them all together. I'm doing my, you know, I'm going through the Bible in a year. And we get to this part, and okay, I'll just skip. Then we get to Leviticus, and skip. <laughs> Deuteronomy, you know, Numbers, oh, skip. I'm ahead of schedule, you know. I, you know. But it, it, we have to admit there are some parts of the Bible that are more exciting than others. But we've got to remember that it's all God's Word. And everything is in there for a reason, and you will definitely know that by the time we leave here today. It's when we come to grips with, the fact, with this fact that we open ourselves up to a whole new realm of Bible study. Now, as you go through the begats, the genealogy, the first thing that tends to stick out uh, to the first-time reader is the longevity of people prior to the flood. We talked about the reason for this uh, discussed in the first part of our study. Is that atmospheric conditions prior to the flood were different. Everybody was made, Adam and Eve were created perfect. There are no genetic issues. There's no disease. There's anything like that in the beginning. Now, as sin comes in, we start seeing stuff creep in. The dying, they shall die. So age begins to take a toll, although it doesn't do it for hundreds of years. Other things start, you know, going wacko but they're they're eating they're not eating processed foods they're not going to the grocery store they're eating organic stuff grown locally all that good stuff you know hey go for it that's right you know the the ground is not depleted of minerals or anything else so they're getting the all the nutritional needs they need all that kind of stuff is working in their favor but this long lifespan of here's a 50 cent word for you the antediluvians which is a f fancy way of saying people that lived before the flood. Their long lifespans seem to wreak havoc on the belief system of some people. They're like, they read that and they go, oh, no way, people don't live that long. That's obviously bogus. It's obviously myth and fable. No, it's only obvious if you don't treat this as an historic document and if you believe that the way things are now is the way they have always been, and clearly the Bible does not teach that nor does hardly any other cosmology of any other religion, or ancient religion. So for this reason, because of the, well, they live, nobody lives to be 900 years old. For that reason, the credibility of the Old Testament and the genealogy specifically has been called into question. But we should, however, take the Bible as a whole. I just showed you where Jesus refers back to Genesis as literal history to use that as a basis for marriage. Now, if it was an analogy or a metaphor or we're just speaking ethereal things, you can't say that. You can't do that. It doesn't work because it's subjective. You think it means this. I think it means that. We all go home with our own opinions and tolerance is created. No, it's not. Truth, by definition, is exclusive. So we have to take the Bible as a whole because if it's wrong in any one point, it could be wrong anywhere else. So you can't believe it. You certainly don't want to stake eternity on it. We have to compare all, the, uh, compare all primeval history with the entire body of evidence to see if it's plausible. And to the biblicist, someone that believes in the Bible, a longevity, a longevity of the antediluvians isn't hard to swallow. Because if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, anything else is a sideshow. They made an axe head float. That's always been a hard one for me. Or they tied a bunch of foxtails together and set them on fire and turned them loose through the turnip green patch. Well, how do you get two foxes to stay still long enough to tie their tails together and light them on fire? But once again, I have to, that's the hardest one for me. But you have to fall back on, well, if Jesus rose from the dead, somebody can tie two foxes. Don't go try that. You'll get arrested nowadays. You know, but, you know, PETA will be right on top of you. Don't do that. But the point is, you know, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, anything else is a sideshow, long lifespans, 
in the situation, in the environment in which we see uh, all of this taking place, even according to computer models, is plausible. So we need to take the Bible as a whole. As has been said you know, regarding the miracles of Jesus, we're, we are talking about the miraculous here. And the, the resurrection uh, eclipses everything. So if the world was as chapter 1 of Genesis said it was, then it's perfectly plausible that people once lived much longer. And if you look at ancient records from other, other civilizations, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Greeks, the Romans, all have lists of kings. The Assyrians have them living for 10,000 years. Now, once you know about their number system, you realize you reduce that, you divide it by six and all this kind of stuff. You come up with some decent, halfway decent number. But we should also ask ourselves, why, we shouldn't, why shouldn't we accept the genealogies as, as fact? To answer this question, we need to take into account how important these genealogies were and are to the Jewish people. Because it was and it still is very important for Israelites to be able to, trans, to trace their ancestry. They didn't have Ancestry.com. They couldn't go looking for a leaf, or, which is pretty neat stuff. Or you can't just take a cheap swab and send it in to somebody, and they come back and tell you you've got 52% here and 8% here and whatever. They couldn't do that. In fact, this sort of thing is, is, is important to most tribal peoples. When Israel took possession of the Promised Land, the land was divided up according to tribes. And the laws of Israel were set up to ensure that no matter what happened, the land would stay within the family, even if you lost it in a bad banking deal, stock market crashed or whatever, and you had the mortgage based on it, you still, the land would stay in the family. You were only eligible to be a priest if you were born in the tribe of Levi. Well, how do they tell who's a Levite now? Because they're still able to trace their lineage. These are very important. The Jews treat it, the Israelites, the Israelis, treat this as fact. It's only our Western mindset and our condescension that thinks, oh, this is just myth and fable. Therefore, being able to trace your lineage was a very important part of being an Israelite, and we should also take into account that God is putting together the annals of history for us. Why would he put false information into his word? Why would he try to confuse us through the very vehicle he's chosen to teach us? doesn't make sense write an instruction manual and then put a bunch of allegory in it <laughs> try it it's hard enough most people do it just by reading instructions the destructions to some people those that don't believe we should trust the genealogies also tend to question the inspiration of the bible and many of them hold that while portions of the bible are inspired others are not who gets determined what to determine what is and what is not inspired that's subjective. Fallen man, does he get to determine that? That's a dangerous, that's a dangerous uh, uh, idea there. Therefore, our view of Scripture and its inspiration determines how we are to look at this chapter of God's Word. Now, you've heard me in the last few weeks discuss this term toldot, T-O-L-E-D-O-T-H, from where I'm from, as toldoth. But toldot, I'm told, is how they pronounce it. And it's in effect a signature. We see this first in Genesis 2-4. We see it again here in Genesis 5-1. It says, This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man, and the likeness of God made he him. The book of the generations of Adam, that phrase is a toldot. It's a signature. That means it, What that literally means is, this is Adam's family tree for X amount of generations, and Adam signs off on it, and then he hands it off. And then you're going to see that phrase again in Genesis 5. These are the generations of this. In the next chapter, these are the generations of so-and-so. That's the toll dot. How did, all this, how did Moses write all this down when he wasn't there? This is how. Adam wrote it down. He's compiling the family history, the family Bible, sitting there on the coffee table. He's writing it all down. And these are the generations of Adam. He signs off on it, hands it to whomever it is down the line. He keeps it going. He keeps it going. And guess what? Cousin Noah has a library on the ark, not just animals. And in my opinion, not only does he have this, he has the manual on how to build this, how to make that, how to do metal work, how to make flutes and heart. He's got all the other stuff in the library too. All that was brought all that had to be brought across the flood. It just takes a while to educate people in how to do it. You have to start over from scratch. 
He brings it through the flood, and, and once again, eventually these records were given to Moses, and he puts them together. Then we see 5-2, five, five, male and female, he created, created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam or Adam in the day that they were created. We see that Adam is used in the plural here, which means Adam normally means man, but in the plural it means all of mankind. So now we see that Adam's family tree now, everything comes from him, all of us, no matter what race, creed, or color you want to put on it, there's only one race, that is the human race. Anything else is superficial. And how do we know that? Because everything it only is able to create after its own kind. So if it can mate and reproduce, it's in the same family. That's science and it's Bible, and you can't argue with it. Anything else is just culture or whatever issues you might have. Verses 3 through 5. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days, and the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. All right, now Cain and Abel aren't mentioned here because Seth is the one that tracks through to Jesus. Abraham's got two boys, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael's the oldest. He's supposed to be the one that the, the family business falls to, but he's a child of the flesh. God inverts the order, gives it to Isaac. You see this all throughout the Old Testament. Just because we're the one that we think is supposed to get it doesn't mean we're the one God has chosen. As we see this pattern continue throughout the duration of the chapter and the Old Testament, I also uh, want you to notice as we go through this, let me go ahead and read the next several verses. Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he, <coughs> excuse me, after he begat Enos 807 years and begat sons and daughters. All days of Seth were 912 and he died. And Enos lived 90 years and begat Cainan, and Enos lived after he begat Cainan 815 years, and begat sons, and all the days of Enos were 905 years, and he died. And Cainan, Cainan, lived 70 years, and begat Mahalalel, and you keep going, all this, and I'm not going to, we're running out of time, I don't read all of this, but the pattern is, is obvious. I also want you to notice that you don't see anybody fathering a child any younger than 60 or 65 years old. And that's because when lifespans are extended, 65 is not old anymore. That's the equivalent of 20 or 25. And there's scientific evidence for this. And I wish I could give it to you, but we're running out of time. But And maybe I'll deal with it next time. But it has to do with your, your wisdom teeth, uh, menstrual cycles. All that sort of stuff comes in. It can be proven that now everything has been condensed from 900 years down to 75, 85, 95, 100, whatever. And so as you do that, now instead of being in your prime at reproducing at 65, 70, or 100, that's been shoved down now to, you know, 20, 15, 20, whatever. Uh, it's, it's all shoved down. And that's why your wisdom teeth make hurt while well, they hurt. I'm going to deal with that some other time. If you're interested in that, uh, get a book called um, Buried Alive by Dr. Jack Quatzo, C-U-O-Z-Z-O. It explains the science of that. Then we read of one of the most intriguing people in the Bible. Jared lived 162 years old. This is verse 18. And he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years. Begat sons and daughters. All days of Jared were 962 years. And he died. Enoch lived 65 years. And he begat Methuselah. And it goes on and goes on. Enoch is mentioned in the New Testament in um, <clears throat> um Luke chapter 3 is mentioned in Jude. He's mentioned in the book of Hebrews as a man of faith. And uh, he was and was not. He was raptured, so, if you will, by God because he was so close to God. He was a man of faith. He had a son named Methuselah. Methuselah had the distinction of being the oldest man to live and die. Why not say that? Because Enoch never died. He's still ringing in the years, to quote Steely Dan. So technically he never died. And uh, he's still going, so he's about four grand in counting, you know, five or six grand in counting. Eventually, we get to know Noah and his three sons in verse 32. The family of Noah takes center stage for the next few chapters. Now, it's been constantly stressed by me throughout this study that we should pay close attention to proper nouns in the Bible, especially the Old Testament. And this is especially important in the gene genealogy here in Genesis 5. If you look closely, hear me now, at the root of every Hebrew name, 
and this genealogy, you're going to find that God has placed a message there for us. Now, if a bunch of guys got together over a couple thousand years and had this grand conspiracy to put this crazy book together, you can't write this. It cannot hook together. It cannot mesh. It doesn't work, you understand. It, this, this shows us that our Bible has a supernatural origin. The finger of God has actually carved it, as it were. This separates the Bible from any other so-called holy book. Take a, look at the, take a look at the list of names and the meanings of the roots in the gospel in the Old Testament. First one, Adam means man. Seth is a substitute or it means appointed. Enosh, the root from Anash, means to be incurable, mortal, frail, miserable. Kenan, sorrow, dirge or elegy. Mahalalel, the blessed God or blessed. El is the name for God. El, Elohim being the plural. Jared or Yared from the verb Yarad means shall come down. Enoch means commencement or teaching and he was a teacher. Methuselah means his death shall bring or, or when he dies it shall come. It means death. Shalak means bring or send forth. Lamech means despairing from which we get the term lamentations or lament. Noah derives from the word nacham means comfort or rest in Genesis 5.29. Now, if you put all these together, we get a statement. And it reads this way. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. You can't make that up. Not over the course of centuries and millennia. And we can study the Word of God forever on this side of heaven and still not plumb the depths of all that God has told us. Even when we see Jesus as He is and we become as He is, we're still learning. That's why we can never be God, no matter what He endows us with, body-wise or knowledge. We're not eternal in that sense. We will live forever. But we had a beginning, and our knowledge had a beginning. Therefore, we cannot be God. And so I wanted to end with that. We need to know God personally. We need to know his character. Not like Lamech or, or Cain. We need to know him personally. It's going to help us in many ways, especially doctrinally. Because when, it's one thing on the academic side in short, terse sentences. But when you add the personal knowledge with it, it makes all the difference in the world. We need to note how easy it is for any habit or practice, in this case bigamy, how easy it is for things that aren't godly to infiltrate our culture and our lives. And then all of a sudden it's what we're accustomed to. It's just what it is. We need to see that man was not backwards. There's technology and science going on here. We need to see that Jesus is our substitutionary atonement. He paid the price for us. We need to know him personally, once again, not just on the intellectual level. And we need to plumb the depths of God's word instead of having just a cursory reading. I never want anybody, they might say a lot of things about this church. But I never want anybody to be able to come in here and say they're 40 miles wide and a half inch deep. Just evangelistic messages every Sunday, trying to get to save, save. Preaching to the choir, hauling water to the sea. And then 30 years later of being in that church, they haven't, they're still on them bottle. You've got to part whiskers on a grown man to stick a bottle in because he can't handle the meat, as the Apostle Paul said. And since they're still running around panicking about everything. Maturity. That's what we want to grow here. And is it, is it academic? Yes. Does it take work and study? Yes. But I don't want us to be so dry and academic that we forget about the personal relationship. The two have to go together. And so as uh, we leave here today, I want us to see that this book right here is a supernatural origin. No matter what some liberal or skeptic might try to tell you, you've got the tools to disprove that. You cannot make this stuff up and hide it in Hebrew over the course of thousands of years. No grand conspiracy from different men it works that way. You can't. The government can't keep a secret for five minutes. How are they going to keep a conspiracy together? No, they didn't kill Kennedy. I'm sorry. I hate I hate to kill you. I hate to bother you about that. But they can't keep the. They can't keep it. This is supernatural. 
And the power behind it will supernaturally change your life. If y'all would, bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and all that's in it. Lord God, all that you have uh, put together in it, Lord. And I just pray that we want to get into it more, to dig and dig and dig and then to know you, Lord. I pray that in our marriages we would dig and dig and dig and communicate and get to know our spouses even better. More deeply, more intimately, Father. And then we would take that analogy and then move it to our relationship with you. This word is so powerful and so important and so true. It's so historic. It's scientific. It's apocalyptic. It's archaeological. It's all those things. It's true. And I ask that we be able to see it that way. And Lord, by knowing that, we come to know you. And we can therefore walk in this world... No matter what the others say, know you know you're true. And Lord, hopefully, Lord, be an instrument to draw more to your word. And we just thank you for that opportunity and that power in it, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Power in it, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.